Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Jessica Eddy, NC3R's Regional Programme Manager for GW4. Welcome to the latest NC3R's webinar on tickling rats for improved welfare. Before I hand over to our speaker, Dr. Megan LaFollett, I just want to make you aware of a few things. This webinar is being recorded and Megan's presentation will be available for future viewing on the NC3R's website. If you have any colleagues that haven't been able to join us today, please do make them aware that they can view the presentation at a time convenient for them. For those joining us live, we'll have a session with a Q&A at the end with Megan. At the bottom of your screen, you should see the Q&A button. Please use this function to submit any questions. Um, you can submit them at any point during the webinar, um, but we'll pose these to Megan at the end. Um, we've had huge interest in the webinar, so I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. Following the webinar, if you are interested in finding out more about rat tickling, you can view our rat tickling hub on the NC3R's website. And this includes blog posts, research papers, and tips for implementation. So now over to our speaker. Megan works with the North American 3Rs Collaborative to advance science, innovation, and research animal welfare. She has a PhD in animal behavior and well-being from Purdue University where she also received a Master of Science in Animal Welfare, especially in practical refinements for laboratory and companion animals. Her primary interests lie at the intersection of human-animal interaction and animal welfare. These interests have led her to conducting projects focused on rat tickling, compassion fatigue in lab animal personnel, refinement for cats in confinement, positive reinforcement in training horses, the welfare of service dogs, and human behavior change for animal welfare. Some of you may have watched Megan's previous webinar with us on compassion fatigue in lab animal research. If you haven't, you can find the recording on our website. So without further delay, I'll now pass you over to Megan and welcome Megan. Awesome, thank you, Jesse, And thank you everyone for being here. I see that there is 304 participants right now. That's great. Um, thank you for taking time out of your busy day um, to hang out with me, learn about rat tickling. Um, I will encourage you guys. I know it's very common to do a lot of multitasking, to maybe start a webinar and maybe you don't finish it. But if you are here live today, I encourage you to give this webinar your full focus. You get the greatest benefits from it. Um, and really watched all the way through and really commit, but I'm really excited to see everybody here. Um, so just to get started, um, so as they said, just as a reminder, um, you can ask questions throughout this presentation. That's one of the beauties of virtual presentations is you don't have to wait. You don't have to remember your question. Just anytime, pop on into the Q&A box, put your question in. I'd love to answer it um, at the end of the webinar if I don't answer it already um, in the, in the um, content. So I'm going to start with really the story of rat tickling because I think it's important to know where it came from. And it all began with the late Dr. Jak Panksept, who's considered the father for effective neuroscience. He and Dr. Jeffrey Bergdorf were interested in developing a technique by systematically studying the neurological basis of positive affective states. Um, they, in particular, were interested in studying the foundations of both human and animal emotions, and they studied all sorts of animals in this pursuit, but much of their work was actually done with laboratory rats, um, which are, I think, a really awesome laboratory animal for many reasons, um, but one of their reasons is the ultrasonic vocal vocalizations that they produce. So in case you don't know, um, rats actually produce two types of ultrasonic vocalizations. The first type is 22 kilohertz. You can see this um, on the screen, that dark line on the spectrogram. Um, and this is what they sound like. 
just kind of sounds sad to be honest, but there's actually really good science behind it. Um, rats, the reason that we know these are negative is that they're produced in situations that we know would be negative. So such as electric foot shock, presence of predator odor, social defeat, as well as application of noxious drugs. They're also produced in anticipation of these events and correlated with typical behavioral ways to assess negative emotion, emotions, such as avoidance and freezing behavior. Behaviors. These 22 kilohertz vocalizations also predict increased cholinergic activity in the brain and are even correlated with the magnitude of anxiety. For example, rats will actually make more 22s when given an unavoidable foot shock, which is expected to be more averse, causing more anxiety than an avoidable foot shock. On the other hand, um, and the vocalizations that is going to be really the feature of my talk today, rats will make 50 kilohertz vocalizations, which actually reflect positive affect. There's actually many different subtypes of 50 kilohertz vocalizations. Um, this is one of them that's called a trill. This is what it sounds like. And again, there's really good evidence for these vocalizations. Um, they're produced when rats are given high value food rewards, euphorogenic drugs such as amphetamines, rewarding social interactions like mating and play. Um, and they're also correlated um, with typical behavioral ways to assess positive affects, such as approach behavior and conditioned place preference. Um, and like before, they're also produced in anticipation of these positive events. Furthermore, these vocalizations predict dopaminergic activity in the brain and are even correlated with the magnitude of the reward. Um, so a hungry rat is going to, pr to produce a lot more 50s when presented with food than a rat that is satiated. One of the ways that I said that rats produce these vocalizations is during rat play. Um, in case you haven't seen rats play before, it's very cute. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, this is a test arena. You can see the rats are running around. They're chasing each other. They're wrestling. It's pretty rough. They're, they're really wrestling. They're often switching roles. They'll do this in standard laboratory cages occasionally as well. Um, you got to catch them at the right time to see them, but they will. Um, and this is what um, rat play, when you boil it down, it really has two key components, a dorsal contact and the pin. These are the two components that happen in so, in so many play sessions that we know that it is play. And that's where rat tickling comes in and where Dr. Yak Pangsep, who is considered the creator of rat tickling, um, he was studying play, he was studying these positive emotions. And so we mimic rat play with a dorsal contact and a pin, these two key components um, to really represent it. So now I'm going to show you a, a video of what rat tickling actually looks like. Um, and I want you to hear just how many 50 kilohertz vocalizations are being produced by this rat. So that's a lot. Um, you should also have seen and noted during that video that it was quite rough. Um, it looks rough. A lot of people are like, whoa, when they first see that. Um, but you can hear she's producing all of those 50 kilohertz vocalizations. Her body's very relaxed. I'll go in more in a little later about how we assess that the rat's liking it. So that's a little background on why neuroscience developed it, as well as why they continue using it as a standard in their experiments. But why should you, you know, let's say you're not doing neuroscience research, um, why should you use it? Well, you may know that rats um, can experience stress during handling. Um, this often occurs when they first interact with us. Um, then we might give them injections, oral gavage, expose them to scary behavioral paradigms. Um, and that can change rat behavior, hormones, and even brain structure, um, which clearly can harm rat welfare, experimental validity, and reliability. Unless you're working with a model that you're specifically trying to cause stress, which is a valid model. Um, but if you're not, then this additional stress can be an issue. 
Furthermore, when we're thinking about laboratory research as a whole, rat stress reduces the benefits of that research because it harms the results and it increases the cost if we're thinking about harm benefit analysis um, because it harms animal welfare. Um, we really want to, when we're working on our experiments, you know, when we're thinking about ethics, we want to make sure that, um, you know, those costs are really less than the benefits that can be very very difficult to measure, um, but it's something that we should aim for. Additionally, um, so one of the reasons that we use rat tickling in particular is that other habituation methods can be time intensive and less effective. Um, so stroking is often initially negative to rats. I know a lot of us maybe were taught to, um, you know, just, just pick up the rat and start petting it or pet it in the cage. And while that can work and eventually rats may learn to enjoy the stroking, there has been research that initially often that stroking is negative and that tickling is more effective and faster. And this is, um, I'm going to show you a graph um, showing that it's an effective refinement that decreases the harm of experiments. So this is from a systematic review that I did in 2017, looking at over 50 experiments on rat tickling that had been published at that time. Green indicates a positive effect, gray indicates no effect um, in comparison to a control condition. Um, so tickling increases 50 kilohertz vocalizations, it increases approach behavior, it decreases anxiety and fear, and it improves handling. Um, so on the whole, it increases positive emotions, it decreases negative emotions, and it even helps humans. So it really is a great refinement if applied appropriately in the best situations. It's also a good social interaction. Um, so of course we avoid housing rats individually as much as possible. Um, social housing is one of the key refinements for rats um, and should be standard. However, sometimes an experiment does require we house rats individually. And so in these cases, rats are really starved for that social attention. And that's when rat tickling can be exceptionally good is for those rats that need a little bit of extra care, a little bit of extra social interaction. Um, it can be really excellent. Now, I've kind of told you some of the research um, of why, why there's all this evidence that rat tickling works. But I know just as you, um, sometimes seeing can be believing. We want to think of ourselves as objective scientists, you know, that, that really rely on the research. And certainly we all hope to aim to be that. But I'm going to show you two videos that really show the difference. So these experiments were conducted by one of my former committee members, Dr. Sylvie Cloutier. Um, and this first video is a rat that hasn't been tickled that's being given an injection. And so I have started the video at this point. I know it doesn't look like much is happening, but that's because before this injection, this rat is pretty much just cowering and freezing in the corner. It does not want to interact with the human. Um, and in this experiment, they really, they didn't do, I think they might have had their hand in the cage. They might have not done anything to this rat to try to habituate it. You can see that she had a bit of problem grabbing it for the injection. She gives it the injection. There's a lot of reaction. Um, and then the rat just goes back and is in the corner. Um, you know, maybe this isn't the worst thing in the world, but it's clearly that rat is stressed by this experiment, which is not good. On the other hand, this is a rat that has been tickled um, before the injection. And I want you to compare the behavior. So you're actually seeing the tickling here. Um, you can see this rat really excitedly engaging with this tickling experience. It's right up next to the hand. She's not even having to pin the rat manually. The rat's kind of pinning itself. Um, when she stops tickling, the rat's exploring. Um, it's going, you know, it's going around the cage. It's not cowering, it's coming next to the hand, it clearly does not have fear of that human um, or its environment in general. She's very easily able to pick that rat up, give it an injection very quickly, put the rat back in the cage, the rat's immediately going around, exploring, looking around. Um, it doesn't even seem like it's affected by that injection at all. 
So those are some of the really good evidence for why rat tickling um, is can be really beneficial. I do want to start off and even I'm going to go into this more later, but I do want to emphasize that rat tickling is not the appropriate intervention for all rats at all times. This is not an intervention that we apply completely evenly to every single study, no matter what. Um, you have to kind of, you know, think about rats being individuals and being read that way and different studies having different aims and et cetera. I'll go into that later, but I did want to put that caution up um, initially, especially in case some of you may end up hopping off the webinar um, part of the way through. But um, that being said, like I said, there is a lot of good evidence for it being good for a lot of rats. So let's learn how to actually do it because it can be challenging. A key refinement for this is to practice on a stuffed rat first. I know this is going to feel silly, um, but um, if you can't tickle a rat that's not moving, <laughs> you're not going to be able to tickle a rat, a real live rat. Um, so ideally, you practice all the steps on a stuffed rat first. You can video yourself to make sure that you're really doing them correctly. Then, depending on your facility's availability, I would recommend trying it on very young rats, um, juveniles, um, and or if you have, if somebody else has experience tickling, if you can tickle a rat that's already been tickled before, that's already used to interaction, they know what to expect, um, that is the best way to learn. To actually do the tickling, we recommend starting by just putting your hand in the cage um, for about 15 seconds. And that's what most of the standard research suggests. This is just to you know, get the rats used to their smell, make sure they've woken up, you're not gonna surprise them. Then you perform a light, brisk dorsal contact on the nape of the neck with one hand for two to three seconds. Um, this is what it actually looks like, and um, that's just the dorsal contact. And the reason that we do this is this actually mimics how 90% of play starts fight, or st fat, play fights start in normal, you know, rat to rat play. So we want to mimic that play. That's what we're doing. And that's what we want to um, remember when we're doing this interaction. Then there's the flip. Um, this is the hardest part of tickling by far. I've taught a lot of people how to tickle rats. Um, this is always the part that they struggle with. Um, and there's a lot of different methods. I'm just going to briefly go over one here. Um, I have an online rat tickling certification course that goes into even greater detail than this that I encourage you um, to check out if you're actually going to end up tickling rats in your facility. Um, so I recommend to first with a rat that again, hopefully you have some rats that are really habituated, you know, maybe they're training rats, they're very comfortable with humans, um, to learn how to manipulate rat body weight. And um, so you can see me in this video, I'm kind of flicking my wrist, you can either flick your wrist or kind of push your arm, and you can get that rats, I call it the butt swing. <laughs> um, this is not a technical term, but it can help you a lot um, with your flip. The other thing is to make sure you use the correct grip. Many of us are used to restraining rats. And so we immediately want to take um, like that right finger. We want to take our two fingers and go around the neck to stabilize the head. This is not a good way to flip a rat. It's not very comfortable. You're going to be picking up the rat by its head. It's also just not very effective. So you are going to have to retrain yourself to do this other grip. Again, there's lots of different ways to do this. The way that works for the most people is the grip shown on the right, um, where I have one finger in front of the rat's collarbones, and then um, the other fingers are kind of under its arms. You know, think about if you were gonna lift up a person, you would go under their armpits um, to support their body weight. Um, and then I try to not get my whole hand around. I'm not grabbing the whole rat. I'm making sure I have some ability to move its body weight. Again, this goes into more detail in my online certification course. So after you've actually flipped, you want to perform a light, brisk, and vigorous pin on the belly with one hand for about two to three seconds. Um, this is what it actually looks like. Um, and again, this is a very key component of rat play. Um, if you don't do the pin, you're not really tickling rats. Um, we have heard from some people who say they're tickling rats by just you know, doing that dorsal contact. 
But that's, and while that's what, how place fights start, that's not how they end. That's only half of them. So we really, um, you've got to do the pin as well. Now I'll just show you um, what I call a tickling montage. You can see all those three components um, with different rats, with different people doing slightly different techniques. Um, these are all slightly different angles. Um, again, you can see I often tickle my rats in pairs in the home cage because this is um, how they're going to be most comfortable. But if I need to record ultrasonic vocalizations, I might tickle them individually. Um, and again, you can even see, so this is a slightly different technique with a much old, like larger, older rat. Um, it can work. You can see how relaxed his body is. And then that's that video from the beginning. So that's what you should do. But it's also very important to um, learn what not to do. Um, so I'm going to show you a video. This is a video, um, I want to start off by saying these are rats that have been tickled for quite a while. Um, most of the things that I'm doing in this video, they don't care about because they've been so habituated to rat tickling and they're so into it that it's fine. But if you would do these things with a naive rat, it could be an issue. So generally you don't want to touch the rump. Um, the rump is actually where aggression is typically directed in rats, not play. So again, these rats don't care, but if you're working with a naive rat, that's not so good. You also don't want to pet your rats. You don't want to try to pick the rat up from the middle of its body um, versus the, the um, under the shoulders. Again, you, I might be able to do it with these really good rats, but you wouldn't be able to. You don't want to slam them down too hard. Um, it's kind of a Goldilocks thing. You also don't want to pin them for too long. You can see eventually this rat is like, oh gosh, please stop. Um, so those are some things to really um, try to avoid when you're doing rat tickling. Again, if you're working with a really habituated rat, they're not going to mind. Um, but especially with naive rats, they're not going to enjoy it. Okay, so that's what to do, what not to do, why we want to do it, but when and how long, how much time is this going to take me? Well, I actually conducted a study in 2018 where I looked at the difference between tickling rats for 15, 30, or 60 seconds. That's the x-axis on the bottom. And on the y-axis, I looked at those 50 kilohertz calls, um, which is considered that goal standard. And what I found was there is no difference between any of these durations. And furthermore, I took a bunch of other measures um, about um, their behavior before and after tickling in the cage, their approach behavior, their anticipatory vocalizations, and we never saw a difference in any measure on how long we, can we did the tickling. Um, so based on this research, you really only need to do it for 15 seconds per rat. And it's possible you could get away with even less. We just didn't test this. Um, and in fact, I believe that 15 seconds might actually be good, especially when you're working with naive rats who've never been tickled before, because it's such a brief interaction then that even if the rat is not loving it in that moment, it's so short, um, they can recover very quickly. I also looked at the frequency of tickling. So tickling rats for one, three, or five days. And what I found was that we see 70% more calls after three days of tickling, but that then it plateaus. Um, I only tickled rats for five days to make sure it was very practical, even if you only had a very short study. Um, and again, we had really similar results for our other measures, um, for play behavior, for anticipatory calls, for activity, for location in the cage, um, so this indicates that you really only need 15 seconds for three days per rat. Now, when should you do it? Um, so we recommend doing it maybe one, if you're, if you're shipping rats in or maybe transferring them to another room, that you tickle them about one to two days after arrival during that habituation period. Most of the times you have to allow rats time to habituate to their new room anyways. Um, so this is an ideal time to get in there, there and preload them with this positive human interaction. Um, we also recommend doing this before you mark the rats, if possible, um, because sometimes the, our marking procedures um, can be a little stressful for rats. If you're just using a marker, maybe not, um, but you still might have to restrain the rats. And so tickling is a really good to way to start off that relationship. 
We also encourage you to do it before you do procedures and surgery. So, um, you know, we there was a study looking at when to do it around injection. Um, we found most beneficial results tickling rats before the injection versus after. Um, you know, sometimes you might think, you know, sometimes in the world we think, oh, we're going to reward the rat with rat tickling. And that can work. You can actually train rats with rat tickling as a reward. Um, but after a procedure such as um, the injection, um, they might be a little sore. Um, and also it doesn't mitigate that negativity of the injection. Um, if you tickle them before, it actually seems to like put them in a good mood and then the injection isn't as aversive. The other thing that I want to note is that there's actually no need to habituate them to a passive human hand first. So again, a lot of you might be familiar with just perhaps putting your hand in the cage and letting the rat explore for a while before you do anything else. With this technique, you don't actually need to do that. You can jump right into rat tickling. The other thing that's really important is that tickling juvenile rats is most effective. And this is based on their natural behavior. So rat play peaks from about 30 to 40 days. Um, so that is the ideal time to start getting rats used to human contact to get this tickling interaction going. That being said, we have had a lot of research using, depending on how you want to think about it, three month, 12 week, 90 day adult rats um, tickled for the first time with really good success. So don't panic if you're like, well, we never order in juvenile rats. We only ever work with rats as adults. You can still work with them. And actually the research does show that adult rats do continue to play. And actually sometimes that play becomes rougher, but at the same time, we just, um, often have uh, tell you to have caution because not only are those rats older, so they're less likely to be in their peak play experience, but they've also likely had other human experiences that may color their opinion of humans in general. So I know some of you might be really excited to go into your labs and start this right away. And that might be okay with some of your younger rats, but if you have rats that you've had for you know several months that are already kind of have that negative human um, experience, that negative view of human animal interactions. Unfortunately, you can't just slap on tickling as a band-aid to fix those problems. It is so much more effective as a first initial interaction than something to apply later. Um, we know that with a lot of our animals, it's a lot harder and with ourselves, it's harder to fix a problem than prevent it. Preventing it is key. So I mentioned this in the beginning, but it's really important to read your rat, um, to really look to see, is the tickling working? Is my rat enjoying it? However, you do need to commit to tickling for about three days with the pin before you evaluate the rats. This is because it takes some time. Um, it takes a day or two. Often uh, what I've seen is just a day. Um, but if you don't do that pin component, the rats don't see it as play. So I actually have had the experience where um, I've, had, I've had someone else try to pre-tickle my rats um, and she was was only doing the dorsal contact because she just she hadn't learned how to do the pin very well before. Um, and if you only do the dorsal contact, we actually had a few of the rats in that cohort that seemed to sensitize to human animal interactions and actually seemed worse. And so again, I really encourage you, um, but you need to stick with it for at least two days, ideally three. Um, again, it's only a 15 second interaction. We do a lot more um, things to rats that can be a lot more negative. So even if the rat doesn't enjoy it, um, just you're getting them used to that interaction. Okay, so you've tickled your rats for three days. It's day three, you're hoping it's gonna do well. What are you looking for? So I'm gonna play you a video that shows a couple of these things. Um, so you can see in this video, this video they've done the dorsal contact and pin. Now they're mostly doing the dorsal contact. You can see that the rat is approaching for the tickling, um, that it's going, it's following that hand. You also can hear there's 50 kilohertz vocalizations. Just wanted to pause so you can hear it over me speaking. Um, also, you can sometimes see joy jumps in very young rats. Um, 
it's like jumping around. It's really excited. Um, generally seeing relaxed bodies and tails, seeing chasing and even seeing finger nipples. Those are all really positive signs. Also, isn't this rat just cute? Um, but this, this is published work. It's really, it's well validated. And um, so these are good signs. What about negative interactions? So you've, you've done it for three days. Maybe there's a couple rats in that cohort where you're like, I don't know if they really like this interaction. Well, there's a couple ways to really evaluate that a bit more objectively. Um, certainly you should use your intuition. I do think, you know, laboratory caretakers, technicians, researchers do have good intuition, but sometimes with new interactions, it can be hard to be objective. So seeing 22 kilohertz vocalizations is generally bad. Um, also seeing extremely frantic avoidance of rat tickling. So every once in a while, I've gotten some rats where not very common, but I've ordered them in maybe from a particular vendor. Maybe they had a bad experience at that vendor. Who knows? Maybe it's freak where I've tried to tickle them and they've tried to jump out of the cage. That's pretty extreme. That means, you know, this is not the right interaction for them tail rattling, that's a bad sign. Um, and now I'm gonna show you a video that shows you a few more negative signs. To give you a little background, this rat had actually been in my rat tickling dosage project and had been tickled for five days, but then had been let sit for a couple months. We had some students do some projects and I had to go through all 72 rats in that cohort to find one rat um, to make this video to show you what negative interaction. So I will say that it was actually quite difficult for me to find this one rat. And after I did this session, I waited like a little bit longer and then tickled her again. And actually a lot of these behaviors um, disappeared. You can see some audible vocalizations. You can hear not only the small peaks, but the kind of screeches. She's really avoiding me. Um, sometimes she might turn her head in defensive posture as if she's looking um, You can also see, you know, she's actually not too bad. She's staying near my hand, but she's kind of frozen. Um, and she's been typical. She's still exploring some. If we saw a rat where it's just totally hiding in the corner, avoiding, that's not great. Um, but these are just some, some spines that you can look at. And you can see I'm often jerking my hand away because I'm having a hard time really getting focus on her. And I'm thinking she might try to fight me. So I'm getting a little bit of this. Um, you can see there, it looks like she's contemplating jumping off the stage. She doesn't. Um, these are some things to look out for. Um, it's not failed for 22 kilohertz are really the gold standard of these things. Um, and honestly, she's not, she's not that bad. I had to put her for five days. And so she was part of the work. But these are, again, some signs to potentially look at after three days. If a rat was behaving this way on day one, I wouldn't be concerned. On that first day, they're what is going on? What is happening? But you only tickle them for 15 seconds, and you usually come back the next day, and the improvement is amazing. Um, they, or actually I found in my workshops, you come back in an hour or two hours and try again. Um, and they're like, oh, I get it. I've had some time to process that. Um, you know, I don't really know what the rats are thinking, um, but it really, you know, day one session, any of these behaviors, totally normal. And honestly, this really wasn't so extreme. So that's why I continued tickling her um, also to get you this video. But these are some things to watch out for. So the other thing to note, um, and that I've kind of alluded to, is that some rats consistently vocalize more than others. So there's actually been 12 different experiments to show this. This is a graph from just one where they tickled rats for 50 days. Um, and you can see that they actually had, were able to kind of distinguish between these two groups. That being said, all the rats were producing 50 kilohertz vocalizations, which are indicative of positive affect. So it wasn't that a group of these rats was necessarily disliking tickling, it was more that one group of rats liked it more. 
And this can be interesting because rats that vocalize more actually respond more positively to interactions in general. So they actually have decreased susceptibility to chronic variable stress. So they show decreased anxiety and fear behaviors and decreased approach latency. Okay, so let's go into just a few final tips about rat tickling. So one thing um, that I would also caution is tickling stressed rats or breeder rats. So highly stressed rats. So if you're working with a model that has a lot of stress built in, maybe that's the point of the model, um, you can tickle those rats, but it can be a little dicey. So just use a lot of caution. Again, this kind of alludes to what I was saying before, that if you've had rats for a couple months, a year, that are very stressed out by human handling already, trying to add in tickling now is probably not gonna be super effective. The other thing is, so one of the only times um, I've been bitten, uh, or I have that I've one of the people in my lab has been bitten. We've really had two times. One was a breeder male um, who was actually in the, or I think he was out of the cage, but he was um, out of his home cage, but he was being housed with a female. So we think that he may have been territorial of the female. The other time was actually the time I talked about earlier, where I had someone else try to tickle rats for, for me, and she was only doing the dorsal contact, not the pin, and she had done that for three days, and one of the rats in that cohort was ex was displaying some pretty extremely frantic avoidance behavior, but I thought, oh, well, maybe I can fix the fact that there's only been this dorsal contact, and she ended up biting me. Um, but I've tickled probably, I don't know, 500 rats. Um, I've only been bitten the once um, out of all of them. So a lot of times people are really afraid um, to tickle rats initially. Again, I've worked with naive rats, rats that really haven't had a whole lot of other human contact. Maybe they've had some, but it's been general, um, generally positive. So you do have to be cautious with that. And then the only other thing is just females with pups. Again, you know, there might be territorial. So those are things to be cautious of. The other thing, so maybe you're watching this webinar and you're like, great, I have rats in mind that are gonna be great opportunities to tickle, I wanna do it. But often we can't just make solo decisions um, in the lab. There's other people that we have to convince. So what are some things that you can say to them? How can you help them out? So you can tell them this is a relatively commonly used technique in neuroscience labs. They use this technique to assess positive emotions. They don't even use it as a welfare enhancing technique. They use it as an outcome measure to measure the effects of their drugs. You can also tell them, well, it really doesn't take that much time while potentially increasing animal welfare, decreasing animal bites, and improving caretaker satisfaction. So yes, it's going to add a little time, but you're going to get different bangs. You're going to get a lot of bang for your buck. Generally, um, the technicians love it. People who do it, it makes them happy. People will say they're having a bad day. They go to tickle rats. It's fun. So it's good for the humans. It's good for the animals. Um, you can also tell them, you know, okay, maybe you want to implement the three R's. Well, this is a scientifically supported three R's technique. There's been over at this point, probably 60 published studies on this technique and it reduces harm. You can also tell them related to that neuroscience um, that 50 kilohertz vocalizations are a validated outcome measure um, that you can use this. Maybe you're, you have someone in behavior where you, or they just wanna know, you can use this as an outcome. You can also tell them that it can explain individual variation. So this has the possibility to reduce data noise in statistical models. Um, you can input it as a variable in your general linear models um, to reduce that data variability and see maybe that drug or that intervention works better on rats that are calling more that have generally more positive effective states than rats that are calling less. It's also an efficient handling technique and pink can be used as a non-nutritive positive reward. I'd also really encourage you to send them my rat tickling certification course. This is completely free. It's highly interactive. Um, I've gotten only really good feedback. It has even more videos um, and more tips and tricks. 
Um, this is one of the quotes. So some people have said, you know, I've read a lot of articles about it, but I found this course vital and hugely valuable for putting it all together. I feel much more comfortable and it's great to have a short course to direct technicians and researchers to. So I really encourage you to check this out. Um, it's linked on the NC3R's website. It's also linked on the NA3RC website on our rodent handling page. And just in case you're still not sure if you want to take this course, um, we actually assess knowledge of rat tickling and self-efficacy and familiarity in a longitudinal trial with 72 um, different individuals. And we found that this course really works. Um, you actually, it increases knowledge, it increases self-efficiency, uh, self-efficacy, and increases familiarity. Again, just to promote the course again, because I think it's so important for you to take this. Certainly this webinar is a good start, but the course you should be able to get through it even faster if you've seen this webinar. It's got some quizzes that you have to take before you can proceed, um, but it really helps. And people have said that it's really helped with their rats. Um, it's helped tame them. It's helped reduce bites. It's helped them accept restraint, um, that the rats can tell when you're coming in. Um, people are really excited about this technique. And with that, I know I've been talking for a long time, so I'd just like to acknowledge everyone who helped out with this. Um, it's not a solo project and encourage you to email me with any questions, to check out in addition to NC3R's Rat Tickling Hub, um, NA3RC also has a rodent handling page and a 3R's newsletter.